Just to welcome everybody into the room whilst, you know, we've got people coming from different places. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Ragged Uni and how this event came about tonight. So for those who don't know about Ragged Uni, it's just a relaxed, informal education project that comes you know, from inspirations of social practices like the Ragged Schools. Um, uh, so, Ragged, Ragged University, um, I started with a few friends down in London asking the question, well, how can we do educational projects um, without any uh, money or infrastructure? Um, it was, so it was a, very much a search for autonomous sufficiency, as, as was drawn from the Ragged Schools movement. Communities came together, shared their knowledge, uh, shared their, their skills, and uh, a whole beautiful history came out, out from this. I, I really love the stories of uh, John Pounds, the, the crippled cobbler of Portsmouth, basically invited kids in and shared what he knew. And uh, that, that really inspired uh, a a court reporter at the time called Charles Dickens, who went, this is a good idea. <laughs> and, that, and a guy up here, uh, Thomas Guthrie, um, at the Greyfriars Kirkyard went, well, you know, I'm looking out over the, the, the grass market and seeing all this chronic and dire poverty. And there was a lot of uh, crime uh, because kids would steal food and then put put in jail, etc, etc. So he heard about what John Pounds did and said, well, why don't we do this? And so people like uh, uh, Dr. Chalmers, uh, Chalmers Street is named after this, went, oh, well, I like this idea. Here's some books. And you can still see the, the records of what everybody gave as he went around. Because he, he turned to the Kirk at the time and went, why don't, I know, why don't we fund free education and a bit of social support so lets people get on their feet. It builds a, a, a great future. And they said, well, it's a bit idealistic. <laughs> so he crowdfunded at the time. And, you know, in, in the early 1800s, raised over 2,000 pounds. So when I learned about this, I asked a few friends, why, why don't we get people who love what they do to share their knowledge in social spaces? You know, we can have a bite to eat, have a pain, and, and learn, because that's very much what I've, how I've learned. Uh, I've learned not from for, through formal education, but through people, so, uh, helping me understand and into other subjects in informal circumstances. So, uh, yeah, it was through friendship and companionship I, I discovered that Ragged School's history. Uh, and I like, I like the fact that the, the etymological root of society is companionship. It makes a lot more sense to me than the, the notion that there is no such thing as society. Um, and two friends, Eileen Broughton and Leroy Wilshire, uh, retired educators. I, I, I got to know them because I, was, I knew a little bit about computers. I would say, well, I can help you. And rather than you paying for a PDF reader, do you know what? There's a free PDF reader you can use to open books. So we connected and they, they said, oh, well, that's, that's quite interesting. You, you kind of remind us of the ragged schools and Ivan Illich, an educator who really had a view that in people's own lives, there's a lot of really valuable knowledge embodied. So. They, they helped me learn a lot about these histories. And part of the history of the Ragged Schools comes from Dr. Andrew Bell. Is anybody familiar with uh, uh, Dr. Bell's school down in uh, Leith? 
So that's one of 12,000 schools he helped pro propagate across the UK um, during that period. And more and more communities went, oh, that's a good idea, let's do that, and did their own version of it. And eventually, in 1870, the government, <laughs> this is kind of good on all fronts. It's good for the economy, it's good for health, it's good for happiness, all it does. So they absorbed the infrastructure built by the people. And that's where our primary school came from. Um, and, and part of the methodology uh, Andrew Bell came up with uh, was the, the monitorial method, often known as the, the Bell-Lancaster method. So you've got Joseph Lancaster and Andrew Bell, two figures in this history. And Andrew Bell ran an orphanage outside Egmore uh, in India. Um, and he had seen local children. The older ones were teaching younger ones by drawing in the sand. He went, well, this is how I can do, create these schools. If we get the people who are most proximal with the, their capabilities and knowledge to teach younger pupils. It's sort of a pass it on methodology, which you can still see in the structure of uh, schooling and higher education today. Um, So he returned to the UK, where the National Society formed around it, to, and they went, right, okay, let's, let's try and promote this kind of social practice. Uh, and, and that gave rise to, as I mentioned, uh, more than 12,000 community schools. Um, and the Ragged Uni, expanded as an idea around people teaching me more and more social histories of education. Almost every culture and every time has some social practice of learning. Some uh, social scientists uh, and animal behaviorists even argue that you can see education as a behavior, as a philanthropic behavior demonstrated in ants. So, um, I, I, I started to learn from uh, you know, various sources, but one of the many great Indian polymaths, Rabindranath Tagore, said, all I need is the shade of a tree to start my school in. And I thought, well, that's the kind of logistical strategy that works for me because I've got, you know, I, we have very little resources to do kind of projects. Um, and it was through a sister project to Ragged Uni that I do, called Social Server, uh, that I came more to learn about his internationalist vision. Uh, again, this is sort of a preamble to explain why is this event here tonight? Why are we looking at these two, two short videos and having a conversation? So, by doing free web development for community organizations and academics, uh, the idea was that I would learn through helping. Um, and I came to build and manage the site for Professor Bashabi Fraser, who runs the Scottish Centre for Tagore Studies. And the, the journal Gitanjali and Beyond. And so I started working with Saptar, uh, Saptarshi Malik in Mumbai, and he asked me if there was anything I could do. And I thought, well, I've never been to India. I'm absolutely fascinated. Um, I, I asked him, could he tell me more about Andrew Bell's orphanage? where he developed his monitorial method in India. Um, and I, I got hold of a, a facsimile of one of Bell's books uh, on his educational system, where I first discovered in the inset that Bell was in India under the auspices of the East India Company. 
I, I, I knew the, 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 the name, but I knew nothing of its history. You know, my, my, there's a shadow in my brain that went, all oh, right, okay, it's a company that obviously worked in India. Um, uh, and uh, Mr. Malik magnanimously told me of the tea plantations, which formed such a history of tea drinking, where to this day some of the finest teas are, are still being produced. Uh, and he, he sort of gave me a sense of the scale of industry. Um, uh, I, I started to realize I knew nothing other than the name of the company. So I really wanted to know more about this, this history. Uh, and this was the beginning uh, of how I got to know about Professor Nick Robbins and Nicholas Shackson, the short videos we're going to watch tonight. Um, um, so through being taught over the years by people who have shared through Ragged Beauty, I've been led to study amongst other things of the anthropology of organizational systems. H how have the organizational systems that we're using today that we organize our world to collectively coordinate come about? Um, uh, so our un understanding our world is, and how it's being structured, partly involved uh, understanding how finance and the economy is organizing the everyday person involved in the ordi ordinary business of life. I was presenting at a conference at the University of Manchester uh, on the inequalities in historical context. It was a uh, Professor Simon Schreiter of Cambridge who first introduced me to Nicholas Shackson. Uh, and, and it really impacted on me uh, because it but he said uh, that the most important book to read to understand today's environment was Shackson's Treasure Islands, The Men Who Stole the World. Uh, you can find uh, the first part of this as an audio book on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, and, and even if you listen for five minutes, you can get a sort of measure of, of, of this guy's work. So he's a, a, a fellow of Chatham House. So he's, he's very well-heeled well as a, a researcher and really gives substantial evidence behind the, the reportage that he, he gives. So this gives you an introduction to how I got here today, bringing these two uh, authors speaking on video about interlinking histories of finance and power. Uh, and a few, this was a few years ago that um, when I found out about uh, Professor Joel Backhand's book and film, uh, The Corporation. I don't know how many people are familiar with it. Um, if, if you want to watch the film, you can see it online at this post, The Corporation. So he's a professor of uh, uh, law at the University of British Columbia. And I thought well, that, that was my first moment where I started thinking about what a multinational corporation is and how it's functioning in the world. Um, and I thought, well, let's do a screening and then have a conversation because this, this is Part, part of my way of learning is crowdsourcing conversations to help me out my filter bubble and find out history's perspectives that I'm not holding. Um, and this, this led me to start, start uh, uh, learning about uh, the Tax Justice Network. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in some resources, I'll put them on the front page of Ragged Uni website. So here's a Financial Times film talking about uh, the, you know, how did London become the dirty money capital of the world? Um, 
Robert Jenkins' partial list of banking misdeeds is constantly being updated. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, so there's a link to Shaxon's, you know, several Shaxon's presentations, but also a link to HR, HMRC annual measuring tax gaps report. Each year, HMRC produces a report on what the agreed tax with, say, let's say, Starbucks. They say, we will agree to pay you £300 <laughs> in tax. And how much of that £300 is collected? So it's, it, before we even get to tax evasion, it's the agreed upon. And, and all average, £33 billion pounds of agreed tax is not collected from multinationals. Um, so, so HMRC, great, great source of knowledge on this. Um, and, you know, we can see other, other interesting resources. So, w without going on into those, um, I thought it would be really good to watch these videos and uh, uh, have a, a conversation and record it so people can who are in the room can also listen. Um, and uh, I've got some prompts, some pieces from, so I've got, we, we needn't go through these prompts, but so this, this is uh, Professor Nick Robbins' book, The Corporation That Changed the World, and how the East India Company shaped the modern multinational. It, it was the blueprint for largely what we're seeing playing out in the stock markets today. Um, and these are just, should, should uh, we want you know, snippets to move on to move into another conversation or whatever, uh, I've, I've pulled out a few excerpts. But this is very much a, an evening of open conversation and uh, me trying to learn more about this huge entangled subject. So I hope that gives a, a reasonably cogent uh, uh, story of how, why I've, I've brought this event today together. excerpt from it. Do, do you want me to read it or, or shall, do you want to read from the screen? What is Union Carbide? So, Union Carbide, uh, uh, I, I think I'm getting... Uh, have you heard about the Bull Powell incident? Yeah, oh yeah, the poisoning and the explosion. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Joel Macken, in, in his film and book, The Corporation, talks about corporations as externalising machines. Right. Yeah, internalising value and externalising costs. So when and you know, right, we're not going to pay for our waste, so we'll just dump it in the waterway. Now this happened in the rural realms some some years back. It it is a bad practice of organisations, and so Union Carbide, I think, was the Bhopal incident. Yeah, yeah, I think so. 
uh, a, a whole travesty that sort of deserves uh, it history being in dispute on the top. By just cutting the umbilical to right, the yeah, end of the century yeah. and just got no consequences from the shipment because ah, cause the company didn't exist anymore. Yeah, so exactly. Didn't have to pay anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just overnight the consequences of it were the Indian subsidiary collapsed and the American subsidiary just the American flag here just cut off all links to your yeah. knowledge. So that, uh, I've got a very related sorry to the a very relatable uh, example here. Uh, I work for a corporation, I work for a capital company that supplies the oil industry. I have a fairly immoral job. But, <laughs> but uh, I also deal with lots of big corporations, oil companies, which are largely, you might not realize this or might realize it, but globally are largely state owned. They're almost entirely state owned as far as the oil production of the world is concerned. But I don't know if you saw it in the news recently, it was in fairly recently um, in Iraq. Uh, they, they were speaking about how children in Iraq had breathing problems. Uh, in, in Basra, sorry, specifically in Basra, they had breathing problems because of the flaring during the oil production activities. Uh, and I've been there and I've seen it. Uh, and I know the cause of it. And my company gave them a solution to it. Uh, but they wouldn't buy it. Uh, let me explain a bit more. Basically, when the oil is produced, you separate the gas off, you separate the water off, but the oil kind of bubbles up sometimes, and then it ends up with the gas, and then it gets burnt. And, and when it gets burnt like that, it makes black smoke that fills the sky. It's horrible. Uh, and, and the oil field there is the second biggest oil field in the world. It's right next to Basra, it's very close. And they have hundreds of flares, like you, like I've never seen in my life before. Hundreds and hundreds of flares, low level flares. So they're only like six foot high. So the smoke is coming from six foot, usually at least really, really, really high. It's put, put it straight into the sky, but there it's really, really low level. And we knew how to solve the problem. We, we gave them a solution to the problem. We said, buy this defomer, it will cost you almost nothing. And the Oil will no longer go into the flare, you'll no longer get black smoke, hundreds of thousands of people will no longer get breathing problems and have cancer and blah blah blah. They wouldn't buy it. Mm. And one more thing to add to that, it would cost them nothing because the oil is no longer going into the flares, therefore they're exporting that oil, therefore the, the oil that they would save from going into the flare would be less than the cost of the chemical. They wouldn't buy the chemical. I don't know how that relates to this whole thing, but it just shows you a corporation acting in, in absolute disregard for, for the community that they live in. Even even though logic <laughs> even though it's illogical, because it would cost them nothing to stop harming the health of hundreds of thousands of people. Continue to this day, just burning like that. So I suppose my question actually relates exactly to what you're saying. I mean, is that you know, in the quote by the Age of Enlightenment, and my my question is, you know, is that the people running the East India Trading Company would have been well educated, would, would have gone to the, the the forefront of our educational facilities, would have, you know, and I would hope, maybe I'm wrong, please, you know, anybody correct me if I'm. If I'm Correct here, but you know they, they would have been in, they would have encountered some of the latest philosophy of the time. You know things that may have expired the the American Revolution and so on. You know this idea of freedom and, and also this concept of, of our duty to our fellow person. And my, my question, as I'll explain how it connects, is you know my first question is how do how do those people receive that education? You know are, are encountered by this concept of, of, of fellowship with their fellow man. And say, I understand this. You know, I, I respect my my obligation to another Englishman, or my, my obligation. Yeah, actually, we're in Scotland, so my 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 obligation to another British person. But that doesn't seem to apply to Indians. And, and, and in some way, based on what you said, I, I'm curious now. I mean, it's how uh, you know. I'm uh, sorry. I understand complete separation between yourself and the company, but 
that your company, you know, potentially would say, well, we're quite well educated people. We have a concept of, you know, our, our obligation to people. And obviously you're saying that the local people wouldn't pay for that, uh, chemical, yeah. that chemical to prevent that. My, my question is, would, why would an, an, a, you know, an enlightened board or an enlightened uh, management group say, okay, uh, the people of Iraq don't, don't understand the value of this chemical. It is a fractional cost. Why don't we absorb the cost? Sorry, I mean, uh, again, it's not, it's not yeah, attack on you, but I'm just wondering why, is, why did your company not say, you know, well, should we absorb the cost in, in the uh, interest of minimizing human suffering as a corporation? I yeah, don't know. Yeah, and they possibly should have done that. I think the, the thing is that you have the second biggest oil field in the world, operated by Ru, it's called the company. It's partly owned by BP, 99, I think, percent owned by the government of Iraq. And then you have us, the chemical supplier, and this is a mega, mega, mega corporation in size. We are tiny in comparison. So as much as it's a tiny cost to this, it's not a tiny cost to this. No. So it, like, it's, I guess it's just about can we justify that cost? And probably for us, in the second biggest oil field in the world, we would have said no because it's a big cost to us. It's a tiny cost, but like I say, it's a negative cost to them. As well, because financial benefits are terrible for them. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, they would make money yeah. out of it and we would lose money out yes. of it. Um, it would, but yeah, you're right, it would be for the greater good. Apologies, it was not meant to say. No, 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 no,
we are so far advanced. We've spent so long thinking about these issues. You know, you should take a leaf out of our book. And I, and I just sometimes question, I mean, is that, do we truly assess our companies on their, you know, social responsibility and their social impact or environmental impact is increasingly is the case now, you know, with, with, uh, well, I suppose Enron's no longer, but you know, you know, BP, Exxon, you know, has the East India Trading Company slightly influenced us to, to not ask these questions? And I think increasingly they are being asked, but you know, how, how do we, um, you know, look at, look at Tesla. I think often people take Tesla as, you know, example of the, the, the modern corporation. And, and I could be wrong, please, again, please, you know, I may not speak from a position of expertise, so somebody knows the contrary. But, you know, you look at lithium mining, and there's a high prevalence of, of, of child labor, underpaid people, and yet people go, oh, well, you know, electric cars and Tesla, it's the future. And you think, but what kind of future is that? You know, is there still a future more of the same? I don't, you know, yeah, well, please. Connection between your your point and your point is just now. If you look at the, the press, there's a discussion about uh, Elon Musk's involvement in the Ukrainian war. Now, uh, he got a request by government to extend satellite coverage for drone flying, so that uh, the Ukrainians could could take out strategic. I, I think it was ports, uh, battleships in the Crimea. So he released his uh, uh, of, uh, bi a biography saying, well, I made the decision to switch off and not extend that drone flying capacity. And, and there was a discussion with uh, J James O'Brien looks at this because he, he, he's like, well, uh, and there's, there's some interesting callers in. One, one guy from the University of St. Andrews goes, well, uh, and th there's a few well-heeled people in there and goes, well, are, they are defense, somebody says, they are defense contractors, like BAE. Uh, so so there, there, there is this tangled knot. And uh, we're asking, is this government or is this private? If we've got in the UK, publicly run prisons and privately run, run prisons. The, uh, what is it, Disclosure of Information, Freedom of Information Act applies to public prisons but not private prisons. So that's just the thought. Sorry, I mean, uh, actually in this is I do have a comment to make, which is, again, poses the question, just my nature, I guess, <laughs> is, you know, with, with, with Ukraine and with Elon Musk, uh, and. You know, please, if anybody here feels it, it's a it's a it's a crude analogy, correct me. But imagine if the manufacturer of landing crafts in World War Two had designed a landing craft that stopped about ten meters away from the actual shore, and they said, "But they said, you know, they said I, I manufacture these, and I, I understand the importance of a free French state and the you know the liberation of Europe, but." I do believe that, you know, every day allied soldiers and Nazi soldiers are, are dying. And I think a truce should be formed in some way. So I've decided to stop the landing craft about 10 meters away. So they're of no use to anybody. And that way we'll, you know, we'll, we'll apply pressure to form a peace treaty. Again, if anybody here thinks that's a terrible analogy, I, I respect that. But I just do sometimes wonder if Elon Musk, when he plays the enlightened centrist of, you know, why don't we make a truce? It's, it's, the Tesla yeah. thing. The uh, Russian government said, you know, if you're going to cover this area, then that's like an act of war, you know, and basically we're going to nuke you. Right. And that's what the, go the Russian government said. So that's why he changed his mind, because he didn't want to be responsible for a third world war. I, 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 I again, I, I think uh, when I heard that sort of part, part of that news bulletin, I was like, Seeing, I think James O'Brien tries to untangle things and brings a lot of different things in. So I don't, he's, he's not saying, he didn't say it, he's got the answers. And indeed, I, hearing this, it did make me think in, in terms of who, how are we making collective decision making? 
how are we, how is, for example, the energy crisis, uh, the, the energy prices are, are, are now I, I spoke to a gentleman who, who works in, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, and he, he was saying, well, we're, we're now watching a whole lot of venues like this, gonna, more are going to go out of business, mm. because simply cannot afford the electricity. You know, and when we're seeing record profits being posted, it does. It makes me think. Are, are you? Is it? Are people familiar with the fiduciary responsibility of the chief executive officer of a, a, a of a company on the stock market to give shareholder privacy? Yeah. So I was going to bring this up actually because I think that's something that needs to change at the moment. Is the way that corporations are kind of structured as to what their purpose is. They, the, their whole purpose at the moment is just shareholder value. And the problem with that is, number one for me, is that it pisses all over the, the employees who should be number one, in my view, you know, like the, the, the people who actually make up the company, who make the money, truly they should come first, not the shareholders. The shareholders, should, yes, yeah, should be second because they own the company, but like, pick the employee first, in my view. So a, a moment in legal history, and you can find, so if you go to this article on the corporation, you can open, uh, these, these are legal documentations of the, uh, a, a very significant moment in legal history, where Henry Ford was saying this, well, like, all my workers are doing a damn good job. What, why don't we, we think about other parts of the model companies? He really was great. I want to pay the people who work for me efficiency wages. Uh, and the, the, if our profits come in, I, I, people should be proportionately uh, rewarded. And Ford was taken to court and lost. Oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you want the, the deeper details on this, you can. But go does, to... does anyone know what the difference is like in UK corporate structure? Because I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Is it the same or is it different? Well, Nicholas, the, the video we're going to lead into after this conversation, Nicholas Shackson is going to help throw some light on how these organizational structures and collective decision making uh, the processes are happening worldwide. So chapter three of his new book, The Finance Curse, is called The Second British Empire. Well, it seems as if, like just from the short film, that, that we understand, or you could look it up and read it, that the East India Company became bankrupt, so the government had to bail them out. So that's written, and there'd be numbers, and you know there'd be a way to follow, like, okay, they lost money because this happened, and they were too big to fail, so we had to buy them out and all that. But, but it, it, even today, we have things like the English... Uh, track and trace system cost £37 billion, pounds, overseen by Baroness Dido Harding, who it seems can add one and one to make two, but she was given the job. And we don't have, we don't have an end to that story. Where did the £37 billion pounds go? I'll tell you where it went. My pocket. I wonder if you said... No, I'm sorry, no, it's a silly question. But no, what I mean is, sorry. Um, no, I mean, to, to answer your question seriously, I mean, you know, you're right, because during exceptional circumstances, mm. there is often an expansion in, you know, for example, I work, I work in consultancy. Right. Consultancy was one of the only industries in COVID to expand. Right. You asked, where, where did 37 billion go? Yeah. And, and, no, I didn't take 37 billion. <laughs> if I was if I had, I'd be, yeah. be having some of my yacht, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but oh. <laughs> exactly. one day maybe. No, but the, the point I think is that you, you're right. There was a massive expansion in demand that Ooh. completely caused overcharge. Right. That in a regular situation, if the government could have said we could wait five years for this, yeah. mm -hmm. you'd paid five billion, yeah. two billion pounds. Mm -hmm. Because of the urgency, a huge amount went into tech providers, Capgemini, yeah. you know, DPS, 
uh, Cognizant. Right. These companies made bank mm. yeah. during the crisis, and nobody's going to hold them accountable no. because there's this kind of so-called, oh, well, they it's stood up. Yeah, they yeah, stood yeah. up during the pandemic. Yeah. They didn't stand up. They waited for profit, yeah. and then they entered the market yeah. when they went, you guys really need us right now. I've never seen How about that list. Billion? You know, I've never seen that list of some of the names that you came out with. I've never seen a journalist who cared to like find out who they were and put it in the paper and go, "These are the people that took the thirty-seven billion, and this is what they produced." Something or nothing. Because I, my my personal belief is that the government is worried when they do right. well, when they pick the right supplier. Yeah. They're very happy. Right. And that would be fine. Okay. They, they publish that. Yeah. When they pick the wrong supplier. Like Michelle Moon. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> then they know they lose voters. Right. And although okay. civil servants aren't technically worried about that, yeah, yeah, they yeah. are worried about that because if the Conservatives then win another election, they will come back and say, you picked the wrong person, right. okay. you're out of a job. Yeah. That's just my opinion, by the way. I'm, yeah, again, no, I'm not speaking for it. Yeah. Just from the industry. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's a disaster, really. You're right. I mean, yeah. you know, as, a, as a taxpayer, we all have a right. It's our money. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of treated as if like, oh, don't no, worry no, about no. That, no. you're separated from it. Once yeah. I have your money, yeah. I can spend it however I want. I yeah. don't have to answer to you. Yeah. Because well, they do. Your it's your, it's your yeah. money. Yeah. It always was. To, to add, add a little something, and I'll, we'll, we'll then look at another quote. Anybody want to do that? Or, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a very big editorial article in the New York Times where investigative journalists over there did a deep dive analyzing 22 billion pounds worth of COVID contracts mm -hmm. and where the money right. went. So the New York Times might be a good source yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's still not 37 though, that's America. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was lying. I did take, I did yeah. take 15 billion of it. I did take 30, I took 15. You get around it now. Big, big suitcases. <laughs> I arrived, I said, no, no, I, didn't, I don't need this much money. And they said, no, please take it. We, we've got to get rid of it. I need it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is the next spark notes. Is everybody read that? So, as I sort of peel back more layers of this onion, I have been horrified to find more and more of these travesties, you know, in, in history. But I, I feel Britain needs to, you, you've got to own this, your um, And I, I had no idea that, like, the East India Company was basically being a drug dealer and, and pumping opium into the, the Chinese culture and that, uh, causing huge, huge problems. And, and if you're interested in notes on this, um, uh, you can look at the Hansard records. The Hansard records, everything that's spoken in the UK Parliament there, there's a transcript created, and it's put online, and it's a wonderful resource to research and research and, and see what was said at the time and how uh, uh, both, both the people in the UK, in, in Britain at the time, were, were lots of people were morally objecting. And uh, you know, the, the, the good Chinese culture were being distinctly undermined. But this was a, a mercenary oper 
operation. Uh, and this, uh, this is part of, uh, you know, Professor Robbins' book. And he gives really good, well-documented detail as to this drug dealing operation. So, um, it does, it, does, does anything know more about the opium wars? in actually giving that and actually when it came to uh, the mid-90s when it came to the end of that 99-year lease um, or maybe it was 10 years before that where the discussion was saying no, no, we're not going to extend it this is going to be ours again and you know, this is going to I guess heal the wound uh, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, a, a sense of being ashamed and defeated and humiliated uh, as a result of uh, this conflict and not being able to, um, you know, to control what goes into one's country and one's board. Uh, has anybody picked up on the argument that the Oxycontin uh, 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 the scandal on the Sackler family. So, I mean, it sort of, in, in my head, does place here are human beings that are in, in uh, the geography of America, the Sackler family, who are major beneficiaries. But uh, as we'll see from Shackson's work, they're essentially not, they are offshore people. That, that money is not going into the coffers and being for the, the roads or the health services in America. So, and, and they're acting globally. So I know, building what you said, is that not super ironic? But You know, is it not very ironic that, you know, something like the British, the British East India Company, the Sackler Company will present themselves as, you know, as the, the British institution, the, the American company providing painkillers and like you said, you know, if you look past the, uh, you know, the, the kind of bunting and the, you know, the, the front, do, do they have any local tax obligation? Do they contribute to local communities? No, it's, it's purely 
you know, I was born where you were born, but I don't pay my taxes where you pay your taxes. And that's well, we were to be benefactors easy. for, I think, lots of institutions. The only one I know about is the BNA in London. Mm -hmm. And when the scandal came out, the BNA had to get rid of them. So I suppose they did things like this. We'll give you a couple of million pounds. It looks good on our CV. You know, the Sackler family support this museum, this art gallery, this, uh, you know, maybe a children's charity or something. Yeah. But it's all, it's all voluntarily. It's not compulsory, like paying a tax. Is it, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. Because it, isn't it ironic that, yeah. you know, you and I, when we pay our taxes, yeah. the government decides how it's going to be distributed. Yeah. Yeah. We don't say, no, 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 I won't be taxed. I just wanted to go to buy what couple but of I, things. <laughs> yes, but I, but I am going to set up an art gallery yeah. of, of art. My first, yeah. I would love to do that. If you sent me a catalogue and said, where would yeah. you like your taxes your to name. go? I'd say, yes, your that name. painting, that yeah. painting, seven, and eight. And invite to 10 parties a year. <laughs> exactly. Like that. Yeah. I'd love that, but it's not a, it's not a luxury yeah. we seem to get. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, it does raise well, a question. Like, hopefully that's a lesson for people, that when you take money from people, well, that's a lesson to so go. We need to find out how they made their money, you know. And that's embarrassing that the BNA took money from OxyContin addicts for all these years that they never thought to let's follow the, follow the money. I mean, do you, I mean, do you feel like there is a because maybe I'm being cynical, but since the 2007, it's America 2008 European financial crisis. Mm. crisis was it 2009 it reached? Eight here, I think. Like, uh, 2008 here, but yeah. traveling in Asia when it reached. Was yeah. it 2009 or was it 2008 stuff? Like that? Anyway, there, there was a movement temporarily of people uh -huh. saying we need to hold our companies to account. Yeah. It kind of feels like that's died out. Yeah, Maybe I'm probably, being ignorant. People might say, no, it's still alive and thriving. But like Occupy Wall Street seems to have yeah. lost momentum because it, it, nothing changed in Wall yeah. Street. People just got tired and went home. Yeah. yeah. It, well, you yeah. mentioned uh, corporate social responsibility, and mm -hmm. the, there's this idea of uh, I'm not sure, uh, greenwashing, other, yeah. other things. Of, you just up this um, surrogate advertising budget, so, right. so you have more more initiatives. Um, I think it, it becomes even cheaper to do to the extent that um, people get fixated on. Uh, I guess kind of issues of identity and representation right. it becomes much yeah, yeah. easier then to to say look look we've got we've got people from these backgrounds on in these senior positions and uh, yeah. therefore the problem solved and you know the decisions are just as nasty yeah. and callous yeah. as they ever were but now yeah. they're made by um, you know a more di more more nominally diverse uh, demographic spread yeah. uh, and that. They're, they're way progressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's an easy, easy box to type in that. Yeah. The more complicated one. Yeah. Different board, same old shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Apologies, I need to. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, this, this, this uh, last quote from here, uh, from Nick Robbins. And then maybe we'll break uh, a short break and uh, have the next. Uh, I mean, this this uh, makes me think of there's a United Nations special rapporteur. There's a couple I follow. Uh, one's uh, Professor Jean Zeidler, who wrote uh, the book Betting on Famine. Now, for eight years, he was the UN special rapporteur on the human rights food, and he he and various UN. Uh, reports 
illustrate it. Uh, as well, there's a Professor Kaufman who wrote Betting the Farm. They, they, their, their reportage was on how the stock market artificially inflated the, the price of staple foods, causing famines in 2008. So if you buy up all the, like, the world's largest wheat harvest was in 2008. So it was viewed as a, a speculation opportunity. You buy it up, and then you can choose the price it's being sold at. And uh, while whilst people on the ground, uh, you know, generally I think people feel quite compassionate about their fellow human being. So whilst we're buying live aid singles, thinking Ethiopia, well, don't want people to be starving. They were exporting vast amounts of food. And if we go back further in time, the, the Great Famine in, uh, in Ireland, they were, you know, you could see the exports that were happening. And uh, there, there's a, a, a professor of international law in America who, who examines the, the Great Famine in, uh, in Ireland. So I, I sort of, I, 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 I've been drawn into looking at people like Professor Dean Zeigler, and uh, um, there was a special rapporteur on extreme poverty who visited Britain, Professor Philip Alston. <laughs> in, in the last, uh, I think it was about five years ago, and he was criticized. He said, he was told, why aren't you going to these unindustrialized places? And he said, well, because some of the places of greatest inequality are the, the so-called developed world. So he visited Britain and re released his report. You can see and listen to his report on Britain. Whilst uh, in um, Tower Hamlets in London, by one metric, is the, most, the richest part of London. By another, it's also the poorest. They've got these glass and tear steel financial towers. And in the shadows, you've got uh, often Bengali communities who, who are being exploited for labor and not being given an opportunity to hold in, in the economy. So that's, again, I, I'm trying to think, where, where I get quality reportage? And the UN strikes me as one of the, the places that I could reach to because I, I, I always find a lot of the media uh, a poor place to get deep detail. You, you're right, so I, mean, I don't know if anybody else remember, but do you, do you remember at the time there was criticism, you know, people saying, oh, you know, how dare you say the UK has poverty, how do you know, as if we're as bad as the other we were. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a lie. And I have to wonder, I mean, you know, maybe this is too big a question, but, you know, we look at, and I'll admit some political bias here, you know, we look at certain uh, organizations, you know, Daily Mail being my, my prime example of, of, a, of an agenda that fails to recognize poverty in our own country, and even more so would refuse to acknowledge the historical legacy of Britain's well, I mean, you know, if we can't accept that British people are poor and are suffering and, and starving, God help the person, you know, who comes from a different country and says, but the British Empire has cost me my, my life. It's like, you know, you know some, of the, some of our major news organizations, again, uh, not a question, but more, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome to anybody, you know, positing a counter here, but... It does seem that our that our major media organisations are slightly oblivious to our own past, even the, the past that generally people people accept, but but we don't have to read about. That we seem to be slightly insulated from by by our by our newspapers who kind of say, you know, like, how dare they ask for their artifacts back? We're not done looking at them, and it's like, <laughs> no, 
how would how would we feel if somebody had come to the UK in the you know before we became you know a civilized nation so to speak? I think we have to look at the present as well. Though uh, mm. China right now is doing some pretty horrible things, and I've seen them firsthand uh, in South Sudan. Uh, oil companies there acting with utter atrocity. Uh, <clears throat> bribing their way into a contract, uh, agreeing to build schools and roads and hospitals, doing none of it. You're having to drive down a dirt track because they've done none of it. If agreeing to employ local people, doing none of it. Just employing, just flying in Chinese people to work there. Prisoners, so that's right. Prisoners, yeah, yeah. prisoners. I bet them, yeah, fuck me. Uh, <laughs> This is happening. East India Company is happening today, yeah. right now, and and we have to remember that also. Yes, we need to look at our past, but yes, we but we also need to be pointing at those that are doing it right now because sure. it's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're, you're right. right. Yeah. You talk about the idea of like Amazon and Darby. You're like, guys, did you you know did you best like flat launch or embargo? Amazon's got a fucking army. At what? What was well, yeah, well, that is it literally got an army, but there are like massive private armies that are playing a super important role in like what's happening now, like reaching the future. Of course, there was that uh, Channel Four documentary on Black Boxer being the first, uh, and they, they spoke about one of the Iraq Iran. Uh, yeah. uh, wars being the first ever private war. Yeah, like uh, like Black Black Water were like a massive game changer the way they were used in Iraq, and that's just exponentially grown in Ukraine with the use of Marga and like the fact that Marga came like not necessarily as close as it might have looked, but they did make a pretty good effort. At um, capturing Moscow. Mm. Um, how, how much should we, um, how much weight should we give to um, the argument that um, maybe a, a, an underlying concern?
was like with these sectors that just splintered the track lines. And yeah. Right in front of them, real time in front of your eyes, just like people popping up, uh, both like going through the sort of official military service thing. And as soon, as soon as we finished our career, I were going into an existing company or just get a bunch of your mates together and just be a new company. Uh, but then, um, like that was a very short lived kind of feeding frenzy, and, the, uh, and it all kind of atrophied as quickly as it appeared. But so, what, what I get is a, uh, is a kind of cargo cult um, uh, capitalism. So, yeah. that is where the kind of situation where, you know, you saw this with the late in the late early to mid two thousands, there was this sort of implicit belief that you bring the private sector in for better efficiency or something like that. Um, and so they've had various things where you know, so I was looking at something on uh, um, you know, re- uh, welfare reforms for those on incapacity benefit to to make them more work active and to do things like that. And they had a program Pathways to work where they start with the public sector and then they have inv- uh, invitations and tenders to expand it with various private sector contractors. And um, there's no evidence that the private sector is any better whatsoever. But then why would they be? Because to the extent that the, pub, you know, the private sector can do better than the private sector, it comes from some kind of genuine competition. Uh, and different companies, different individuals offering different solutions, and the people who uh, you know who, who are in receipt of the services making decisions between them. But that's not what tenders about. That's about uh, you know, someone looks, you know, some body, of, you know, some committee looks at twenty, you know, five or six forty-page applications and see whether all of the boxes have been filled in and completed when the overall price is less than the competitors. Yeah. And that's that's not real um, that that's not using the price signal to come up with better solutions. That's just creating another gain and another layer of bureaucracy and inefficiency within that system and another place in which public funds can get uh, misspent and confused into other organizations. Yeah like my favorite example like totally unfair example private sector would always be to put like um, NASA and SpaceX on a timeline and you see like the time it takes that NASA to put up like the Saturn V rocket and the time it takes for SpaceX to reach that payload into orbit absolutely bananas like the Saturn V's were going up in like I think the 50 and like SpaceX has taken decades to even rival that kind of payload. And like it's a completely wildly unfair example because NASA yeah. was like the private sector and SpaceX is like some bully or playboy's like hobby. But <laughs> can, I, can I give you the. No, I mean, my, my point is very brief. I mean, it, it, based on everything you've said, I mean, it does seem like, you know. Behold, the capitalists seeking to try and emulate the public sector. I mean, it does, you know, and, and I know maybe you might argue that that's wrong, but it just it, does anybody else feel like that, that we're talking about these these private sector enterprises in, into what would historically have been described as the public sector and how it tries to navigate the balance? And don't get me wrong, you know, is, is public sector necessarily the most efficient? Probably not. But it does seem to always hold the principle that private sector entering the public sector seems to is trying to emulate. You know, talking about new labor. I mean, you know, look at schools, hospitals. This new labor concept of you build them, we'll lease them from you, and it's like and PFI. So exactly it's right. Such a concern uh, to be a balance the books, uh, left and centre party, that they will be willing to spend 
more the next generation or the next or generation. The future. Well, yes, in order to make it look like uh, less has been spent. But you know, but but but, uh, but are private corporations ignorant of this? No, I think they know that they're kind yeah. of going, look, you know, saying to the government, you're trading the long-term benefit yeah. for the short-term. You know, I, I, I mean, again, I'm well, there, there's another really holding nothing to my chest. Short term, which is, uh, if I remember the corporation, I think I've read the book and watched the documentary, but the prime, one of the prime ideas is the corporation. It, it's weird, you have the individual, which is one, then you have the company, which sort of means many, mm -hmm. and then you kind of expand the scale again, and you get to the corporation, which gets to one again, so the corpus, body. Becomes, it, it, you know, it's like the the individual cells and the uh, you know the, the persons involved. They just kind of diffuse into a single body. So it's, uh, it's this idea of uh, the corporation being a fictitious person and thus granted rights. But it's a person that has very very narrow interests. So, so it's a corporate corporation. It was sort of described as being uh, a sociopath because it doesn't care about external consequences. Um, but it was just thinking about the, the profit motive for the other thing. But the other aspect of it is it's um, selectively immortal. You know, because you've got companies that live for, for hundreds of years, it doesn't have a natural lifespan. But it can choose to die. So when you're choosing you know, companies, so you take some of the, the companies, uh, like Purdue Pharma, I think is well done. So is that OxyContin? Is yeah, the well, Pharma, well, OxyContin, yeah. whereas uh, you know, I think many of the Sacklers have still got a lot of money. Because it's, it's the Purdue Pharma that's died, it's not the, uh, the Sackler dynasty, it's not the... But, but you know, I, I like describing, I mean, there's certain industries where you would say, in some ways, you now private enterprise has a role to play, but it's a very minimal role, and yet it takes a very dominant Position. I mean, you know, OxyContin, we know how bad OxyContin has been. It's still prescribed by the NHS. It's not off their books. They they buy it, and they buy it from, I, I don't know, I, I don't think Purdue Farmer even went bankrupt, did it? it? It still exists, doesn't it? It just paid a huge buy. Yeah, I think, you know, I think certain things have been wound up. But the idea that having limited liabilities and say the debt dies with with the death of this fictitious corporation. So you can keep it alive as long as it's profitable and as long as it's valuable. But what I'm meaning is, you know, is that painkillers is a is a very defined market. You know, we, there's, there's definitely room for innovation, there's room for better painkillers, but but the concept of a painkiller is, is, is set. Whereas you might say with uh, personal kind of entertainment devices, we don't know. There's room for innovation. What I think is interesting is that some of our biggest corporations exist in an area which would arguably could be defined as a, as a set market, painkillers. Why are some of our biggest companies in a market that's preset? You, you can create demand. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the, uh, the key uh, kind of marketing innovation of Purdue Pharma was saying, um, describing pain's uh, ought to be the fifth vital sign of the. So, so yeah. you, you get your blood pressure taken, you get uh, you, you get this, 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 and this. It's part of the standard GP's battery, but they don't care whether people are acutely in pain, and that ought to be measured and managed as you know uh, as part of the standard package. And then you say, well, now we've identified so many people in so much pain. Got these ready solutions for managing pain. They were Whereas marketed, they were marketed to, to workers as a way to keep working. They were marketed to nurses with sore backs as how to get through your eight hour shift. They were marketed to people that worked filling shelves in Walmart as a way to here's a cheap remedy so you can get through your shift. They were also help you get to sleep if you take an extra one. And and the way that the drugs are marketed in the US is the adverts come on the television. You know, this is this drug will fix this. Yeah. This drug will be to sleep. This drug, and it, and it just it creates a want. Then you know, because because it's not, but it's not hard to sell heroin. Yeah. When it's not called heroin, but it's exactly. very hard to sell heroin when you yeah. when it's called. You know, if I said yeah. to you, I said, you know, 
you can't sleep at night. How about you some heroin? You go, oh, no, no. Yeah, I gave her the white coat comes on the but television. And exactly. Say, oh, he's got a bad <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah, so you know, this is the same. Somebody else calls it a different name and says, I'm a doctor, yeah. I should just... Yeah. It's very different marketing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's completely and cool. they knew what they were doing. That's what the evil is. They knew yes. it was addictive. They I mean, knew it was harmful. I'm guessing, did anyone else here have Netflix in terms of watching that? Yeah, Dope Sick. Yeah. Dope yeah. Dope yeah. 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 Oh, there, there was a book called um, Dreamland by Sam Jones. It was about the Dreamland Dreamland. Talking about how there were actually two levels to it. Mm. So you, you take, you know, because in the US, health insurance in so much linked to employment. Um, you can imagine someone who's got that slightly bad back uh, and they can't work too well uh, because of the pain, but then because of their uh, job-based health insurance, they're then prescribed OxyContin, then they get addicted to it and then they can't work again. Now they're an opioid addict and they've got no access to it. And that <laughs> is what creates the second <laughs> level of the tragedy. Germans, this new and ready market of um, desperate addicts looking for opioids, that creates the, the market for fentanyl. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And, and it, you know, it, it was only because of that first stage of the legal opioids or, uh, that there was then this demand for, uh, for illegal opioids. Yeah, it's a tragedy. Can I uh, suggest we, we have a break? Because I think Nicholas Saxon does a wonderful job in, in casting some really well thought out light on, on a range of, of the areas we've, we've sort of touched on. And uh, if you've got any recommended reading for me, well, you know, and I'll be writing, writing up a wee article about what I've been thinking about, what I've been learning, so that it becomes a learning resource. If you think there's a good book, a paper, a good documentary, a good source of well thought out information, please write it down and it's a great way, a simple way of sharing. So there's uh, Mr. Shackson. Uh, and uh, I, I've found he, he gives every single presentation I've heard him do, and then there's a few on online. Uh, he brings that same kind of temperament to it. So it's not like spicy for for the papers, but it, it is pretty powerful in as much as we're we're we're. We're getting an insight into things that are talked about in places like uh, uh, the t the Great Tax Robbery is a really interesting book. If we think, you know, the, I can't recall who wrote that, but he was formerly working at HMRC, and he does, does a, a really nice analogy at the opening of the book: tax. If you think about buying into a club, like, you know, you pay for a membership to go to a gym, and you get use of the pool and the sauna and the steam room and the uh, yada, 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 he then breaks down what you're getting for your money. And he dispenses a book talking about the benefits of this mechanism of redistributing wealth. And, and the econ economists I've had the good fortune of having a chat with uh, really impress, have impressed on me that, uh, well, thinking about not just the short term, but the medium and long term vision of, a, of an economy it, it is really important. I, I, I spoke to a, a gent who was a CEO of a company, a large pharmaceutical company, uh, and he, he, he conferred to me an anecdote where they had a product, they wanted to get to market, they went to local, you know, British banks, and they said, okay, we wanted to do it in five, five years, not your projected ten years. 
And I went, well, like, we've done our figures. It takes 10 years to get to market. But it's this fruitful. The, the long story short is they, they went to German banks. We went, oh, OK, 10 years. Yeah, and that's, that, but that chunk of investment went in to and actually worked out really well. Um, so tax, if, if we want a thriving economy, I've been told by uh, some economists, <laughs> um, it's really good to think about the medium and the long term. If we don't fix our roads, the roads are trashed. So what happens to the delivery of goods to shops and all that jazz? So that, that, that's sort of a we're still to be Yeah. I guess um, it's, it's all related to like the, the portability of a business in my in my mind. Like uh, the financial industry is very portable. Like it can it can just transfer from London to Hong Kong if it wants to, either in terms of jobs or in terms of uh, just the numbers move from London to Hong Kong, and therefore the tax is paid over there instead of here. And then you have the other extreme, uh, I'm sorry to go back to oil again, but it's obviously what I know about, but uh, oil is the opposite, you know, it's geographically grounded. And since the 1970s, the North Sea is an example, it, it's been ring fenced, so they cannot, it is illegal for them to, to take their profits outside of that. Uh, platform. So they have to pay the full tax on that, and that's why the tax for, for, for North Sea oil is uh, between 70 and 85 percent for UK and between 80 and 95 percent or something for Norway because it's ring fenced, it's, it's enforced in law, and you can do that because it's geographically fixed. And then there's other things in between, like if you have like a uh, say you have a pharmaceuticals company like he was speaking about and you have a production plant. That's a place where it might move, but it would take them 10 or 20 years to move. So you can probably press them a bit more and tax them a bit more and, and make sure that they're ring fenced a bit more, but you can't do it too much. Otherwise they'll move out of the country and go somewhere else. But the finance industry, you're throttled by them because they can tomorrow move all of their money out of where it is right now to another financial center, pay their tax elsewhere. The whole thing is gone in an instant. So they have you by a fucking throttle and they can do whatever they want and they can say to the government, if you, if you put a tax on us, we'll leave. And they have to believe them because they can. That's the problem with finance and that's the problem with having so much of your tax base come from something so portable. <laughs> Sorry, my, my question really is, is you, know, you mentioned Norwegians, is it really true? I mean, could, could the Norwegians overnight, you know, I mean, the, you know, Norwegian uh, sovereign wealth fund owns 1% of all, is it, is it global or is it European? Global, it, it's global, yeah. okay. You know, it's not insignificant. What I'm meaning is, you know, Obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, the model for Norway is easily applied to Nigeria, to Kuwait, to Iraq, to, you know, the, the other oil producing nations of the world, but it seems there's some promise there, isn't there? I mean, if I the Norwegians Saudi, are in a secure position. I think Saudi Arabia, uh, um, hmm. a very, various Middle Eastern countries also have investments or sovereign yeah, wealth right. funds. Qatar is the biggest one. Yeah, so they have similar, I guess, effects on the world economy that the big pension funds have. They have that much. The, the issue is how do they spend that money? Is it on just giving uh, you know, young people lots of money so they don't have to work, so they can basically employ these employ modern day intelligent servants to do all the things they don't want to and drive. I, I suppose my question is, or, that it, is, is are, those, are those funds large enough that they're immune to Western pressure? 
that are we in, in the UK, the EU, I wish you could say that it's one and the same, but they're not, but you know, the UK, US, uh, the EU, and the US, if we apply the pressure, are those, are those some, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Saudi's is not, Qatar's is, for sure. Right, I mean, so, so are some of those sovereign wealth bonds not quite large enough that they can escape the gravitational pull that we say, we don't want, I we don't want Qatari money, we don't. Sorry. But like, we're going to have a problem. Hmm. Like, we're not going to be applying that pressure because like, the city of London's one of the biggest offshores and all the other like top tier offshores are like the Cayman and the Bahamas and shit. No, like, no. if we were going to be applying pressure anywhere, like, probably the city of London would be the first people to feel it and behave. Like, like, the government, like, either, bra either uh, color of Tory party that's available to be voted for <laughs> is going to pull the same shit. Like, for. Yeah. I've got to um, go now, but there's another author with very similar territory. So I think Oliver Pollock has written a book called Moneyland, which covers London finance and another called Buffett of the World, which I think is more about tax havens. It's more about maybe the kind of reflective glory of you have all of these old Etonians who feel comfortable around wealth and money. Uh, and maybe amongst other reasons uh, why the UK was foreground and, you know, at the front of tax havens was because certain people in some position of power went to still feel as power as their and as powerful as their predecessors would be. Uh, I think there's more to it, but uh, I, I think Nicholas Shacks and uh, Oliver Bullock almost sound like they come from the same territory. So. I don't know what they made with each other, but... I, I, in, a, in another interview, he's, he's mentioned... I, saw, uh, I, I will chase up those volumes, I'm much appreciated. Uh, now, I, everybody's... You know, you're, you're, it, we've had a good old chin whack, and you, you're welcome to go. But I've got a few quotes here. How's it... Uh, does anybody want to go through a quote, or...? How many quotes? <laughs> <laughs> I've got three, but we can do one. It, it depends how you feel. Okay, fire on, fire on, go for it. Well, let, let's do one. Cheers, safe home. Yeah, right. So, what's the long for? I have a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I read it out or? No, it's okay. This is from Nicholas Jackson's book. Page 10. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it is a really nice opening to the book because. Um, the finance curse. Yeah. The finance curse. What he does in the opening. Is he, he he uses a case study. So we know a lot of people buy train tickets and we go easily to train line. And he traces the transaction where your 75 pet charge goes. And it's absolutely spectacular. Like through tw over 23 really? secrecy jurisdictions. You know, i.e. tax havens. Like, so, so the investigative, you know, I, I, I'm interested in the idea of art, the creation of artificial scarcity. All right. It, there's, there's one way that you can create value in an economy. We've got, you know, several bakeries 
uh, say, oh, well, well, I could make a tea shop or a coffee shop or a sandwich shop. And it, 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 it adds a certain amount of value. Or I can function in a way to create scarcity so there's, there's, there's less choice. Actually, now there, there used to be several bakeries, but now there's only a supermarket. So if we see the saturation of the UK with free newspapers, and, and you can see the disappearance of small newspapers and, and the, the, the aggregation of buying up of, like Microsoft is a great example. Their strap line was embrace, extend, extinguish. Their strap line. Yeah. Uh, and they were taken to court, and we can look at the court records in terms of the monopoly. Now, rather than adding diversity and value, they were creating artificial scarcity. Does, it, does that make sense? I want to use the term. Yeah. So you can add value into the or 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 uh, take opportunity away. Manipulate the world. <laughs> if if I, do, I I can do less work this way, yeah. and if I take choice away, people went wind up. You know, well there's you, there's several choices, but they're all going into the same coffers. So. You know, this is one of the prospecting uh, concepts. I, uh, this links Sha uh, Shaxon to uh, our previous speaker, Nick Robbins. So this is chapter three of his book, the second British, British Empire, he's calling the city of London. So it's been a long night, and I, so I don't, don't want to pull everybody through the hedge backwards, but you can see how he's tuning into these same organizational structures you find in this East India Company. Uh, 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 when the East India Company closed, what was very interesting is that Lloyds of London opened. So we really have... Yeah, um, that's been kind of the question, but it's been not answered. So, what will the back of my brain is like, did this just evaporate? Like, where did they go? Like, so, you, like, Lloyd's is pretty much the closest direct inheritor. How much do they metastasize? Is for, like, is it broken up and spread throughout? Well, or that, is it just one? These are questions running through my brain. And a friend of mine a long time ago, uh, I she worked in the city of London. Um, she, 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 I, I believe it or not, I, I, at one point was, was studying to be a trader. Uh, and and she, she was going, oh, well, you know, I could get you an in. Uh, and I was looking at financial compliance and uh, contract certainty in the light of Silverstein's case. But she, she made a beautiful point, a brilliant thinker. And she said, in the great economic crash, money didn't disappear, it just changed hands. Yeah. Ah! Uh, I don't know about you, me, you know, and I, I'm ashamed to admit this, but, you know, I mean, for some, my, my wealth has, has come from Ireland. And I, you know, and I think, you know, the, the suffering of India 
is sometimes compared with Ireland. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, the, I mean, I'm not trying to say that Ireland had an easy time. Ireland suffered through huge problems. But a, but a minority in Ireland have, have benefited from the British Empire system yeah. up to 19, is it 1922, I think, is when Ireland separates, you know, roughly in that period. I mean, you know, the exact date is not particularly important, but... And I, I think listening today, to be honest, that, that's slightly, you know, come true for me as I was sitting here thinking, okay, well, you know, my family weren't part of London, they weren't part of the, you know, the Liverpool, uh, London, Manchester, you know, slavery exchange. No, but they made a lot of money. And it, it's a question, you know, about the, the British Empire in terms of, you know, who benefited. I don't know, you know, where am I going with this? I'm not sure exactly, you know. Keep going. <laughs> no, so I'm just, just digging a hole here. <laughs> no, but, but you know what I mean in terms of sitting there thinking, you know, what, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, the legacy of British colonialism rings true in areas that I think sometimes we're reluctant to believe. And what I mean is that is, you know, I, I come from a family of, of, of Irish nationalists who benefited from the British Empire. How do you reconcile that? Because it is two contradictory beliefs. I don't know, you know, sorry, no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. No, so see, I mean, where am I going with this? I don't know. I mean, I'm just I'm trying to get to the point that, like, I'm just, it, to me, that seems like one of these areas where we say, you know, history is complicated. Yeah. How do we, you know? I felt like you have to reconcile, in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm from a dark family, you know, like, we have no. <laughs> Thank you, that makes me feel better. <laughs> we have I'm clear. No, we have no connection to it. We're, uh, we're fucking dark, but. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, the past was horrible. Everyone has a connection to horrible. The past was, the, was horrible the world over. I, I, I don't think you need to reconcile anything. That's but, my opinion. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> because that's interesting because, you know, I mean, sometimes when I hear, um, you know, because I, I, I completely respect your point, but sometimes I hear people talking, you know, and they say about, you know, the historical abuses and they say, you know, the British Empire hurt my family, you know, they killed so-and-so. Maybe, maybe there's a disconnect. Personally, I'm not particularly, you know, I wish I could say I was rich. I wish I could say, you know, oh, I've got millions of pounds to pay out in conversation, but but I still feel guilty. I don't know about you. Do you not feel like no, if there's don't. any... I don't feel guilty. Okay. No, I think the, work, the world during that time was horrible in all sure. directions. I think we were a bad direction, but like before, after, during, everyone was horrible to each other in all directions. I don't think we're, like, we were the top ones for a while, but, like, so you see what I mean, you know, be, be there was a time own. where human life was valued much less than it is right now. But, but I, be I, your I, own position, I mean, do you, you feel like you, it's purely well, meritocratic? Or? Of our Western European open. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Well, you just yeah, don't but I mean, oh, I, yeah. I think the oh, slave so. owners in the Middle East would argue with that. Like, well, it's like I mean, the in Europe, it's the Europe in Europe, it's a Europe type in Belfast. Oh. It's kind of a local phenomenon. Is that right? So the, the uh, uh, you're you're a trap. You're from Ireland. Like yes, yes. The most bombed hotel in Europe. Europe. Like is Europa Europa in Europe in Belfast. Belfast. Oh, the Belfast is not Ireland. Sorry, Belfast is not Ireland. Belfast is Northern Ireland. No, that's yeah. not real Ireland. Like, oh, I mean, uh, no, sorry, no, I just mean it's from an Irish perspective. Yeah, I agree. I mean, no, it's it's in the past, nobody had the luxury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. one day, but not since all of the crumble. It's a modern luxury to value yeah. human life. And I suspect that, like, the value that we were able to place on our lives is being kind of creepily eyeballed by a lot of the fuckers that set up Brexit, for example. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, the, the, um, like the financial crash of the, like 2008 and all that stuff. It's like a of salt on that. Yeah, you're right. So I, I thought I've got on the idea of sort of but one being born into a different moment in history. 
and indeed different contexts. Uh, I'm interested in John Muir Keynes, mm. uh, a thinker. He he he, he was uh, particularly involved in sort of post Second World War thinking how how international finance was going to be structured. There's a whole there's a whole talk in this, but one of his his points that he he was saying was the distance between the owner of the enterprise and the enterprise itself allows for more the more space there is the more problems can crop up crop up so if i own lots of houses in canada i just go well i'll just employ a factor and i'll just say the factor look ah you get a wage i want some money you you sort out the rent now unless i occasionally go to my houses and go, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait there. Well, I, I could turn up and it's lovely, a lovely community. Or I could turn up and as an absentee landlord, nothing could be fixed and people could be living in moulding houses. So that idea of extreme distance. Yeah, it's like, it's like my example from before with the smoke in Basra. The, the guy that's in charge of the chemical budget it's like, no, I don't want to increase my budget. I've been told this year I need to decrease my budget. That's the end of the matter. Because he's very distant from the actuality of it, which is people choking in their beds at night because of the smoke. <laughs> and, and, and within the corporation, he's very distant because chemicals has nothing to do with the health of people in Basra. You know? And I think these two commentators that have tuned into I, I don't think they're on witch hunts. I think they are asking significant questions about what, what does a healthy economy look like in situ, like, 21st century? Is it, is it a witch hunt? I mean, you know, is, or is it, you know, are these relevant moral questions that, you know, 50, down, 50 years down the line, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, are, are we gonna are, are we gonna reflect a hundred years from now and say these questions were pertinent, they were important for human development? You know, and I, I, I might sound again. I know people will probably say no, it's a terrible comparison, but I think at the time of slavery, people might have said, "What are you talking about?" You know, I mean, slavery will always be a a fundamental right of the of the capitalist to, to use slave labor. The question is the quality of the rights of the worker. And it's like, well, maybe the big question here is slavery in general. And I wonder with capitalism, we talk about the deal we give the local. Is the is the bigger question that their, their engagement in, in the capitalist system in, in general? You know, I mean, uh, like you said, I mean, you know, the, the the worker who says, "Oh my God, I'm choking to death every night because of this, you know, this oil fumage." If only there was a system that engaged that, that invited me to engage in the system that decided who buys that chemical, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just a. Yeah, and, uh, I, I, I don't mean you're the head of the entire system. I think that goes back to what you uh, showed us about like how the corporations are uh, bound, and in America they're bound to uh, look after the shareholder, and that's about it, isn't it? Uh, I think that that's what needs to change in the world. The corporation mm -hmm. needs to be bound, be bound by more than the shareholder. Needs to be bound, be bound by the place that it operates and the people it employs. And those three things, the place it operates, the people it employs, and the shareholder should be equal. It shouldn't be just like one is superior to the rest. Because all three of them are needed for that company to exist. And all three of them need to be in good health for that company to be in good health. Well, or so at least you and I aren't paid enough. So <laughs> you and I aren't paid enough to justify our higher level of justification. Yeah. We're able to see, well, it should be everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want that when you're at the top. 
<laughs> exactly. You know, the CEO might say, I don't, I don't see it that way. But no, that's what it means. No. You and I can see it that way because uh, we care. Exactly. Um, just, you know, the sharks never discuss Al Qaeda. But uh, he treasure island. He, he discusses. There's like, there's like dark you, money. There was something very that was discussed very early on in this, but kind of like just passed by immediately where we talked about how all this is very much externalized to the US. So like as a US citizen, you don't get away with shit compared to what people from other countries do in terms of like tax dodging. Like it's really hard to tax dodge inside America. Like Uncle Sam will get his yeah, slice, right? Uh, compared to what like British millionaires uh, could get. Uncle Sam's to. a lot more aggressive. And a uh, big part of the reason for that is that a lot of the Al Qaeda's modus <coughs> operandi was shifting stuff yeah. into the Cayman Islands. And the Americans no, were already a bit of tight trying to put down on that stuff. But then when 2001 happened, September 11, like, they just shut the flood, closed the flood games and sleep So, yeah, I was just wondering if that would work. I think this was something which gets a lot more easy to do treasure islands. So I don't really remember it. I think that would be something that came to that I think the central point he's trying to make is that we should talk about tax payouts, but yeah. secrecy jurisdiction. Well, yeah, and when there's a lack of transparency, it, it, like he says, it's not always uh, you know, nefarious. Yeah, if you accuse everybody of being nefarious, but well, like at its heart, the idea is behind the Swiss bank, right? Like just the ability to like I wish I had one you know, walk Sorry, into a place, I live in a put up, week, put so some stuff in a vault with a key, you know, right? Like so it's good, but you know, it's no, obviously no way it's sketchy. But at the end of the day, if you don't like privacy, then the most important thing is your doors. Well, I think this is a good moment to wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, uh, speaking to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.